Kevin, thanks for joining us. Yeah, thank you so much, Matthew. Thank you for having me. Why don't we start with your background, where you started off, uh, and a little bit about your career and what kind of work you're doing now. So, uh, so uh, uh, right now I'm a professor of public policy and political science at the University of California, Riverside. Uh, and I, uh, to become a professor, you have to get a PhD. And so I have a PhD in political science from the University of Chicago. Uh, and I got that back in uh, 1999. And, um, uh, and then I had uh, three years of fellowship time uh, where I was at both at Berkeley and at Brown. And then uh, now I'm a, an, I've been in a, a professor at UC Riverside since 2003. And where are you from originally before you went to Chicago? I grew up in Southern Indiana and then moved to uh, Maryland outside of Baltimore around uh, middle school uh, and then college at the University of Virginia. So, yeah. Great. And in terms of the, the work that you're doing now, what can you do, you know, or, or at least your, your broad research interests, can you talk generally speaking about what are your, the broad reach of your interests over time and, and where that's leading? So uh, broadly speaking, I'm interested in uh, deliberative processes within the United States Congress. And that, that's mostly what I focused my career on. So uh, early on in my career, uh, in, in fact, when I, uh, when I uh, what my, my dissertation looked at the uh, role of policy expertise in congressional committees and how it is that um, as interest groups make use of, of policy expertise as they're lobbying Congress, what are the circumstances where, where Congress can actually learn good policy information from the arguments of interest groups. Uh, and that was my dissertation and it became my first book. And that was the basis of a series of projects that I did uh, for my time uh, starting in graduate school through my postdoctoral time through being an assistant professor. And then about the time that I, I got tenure uh, here at UCR, I got an NSF grant that enabled me to shift gears and to um, uh, the grant was uh, actually collaborative with the Congressional Management Foundation and also with the, the Committee on House Administration and the House of Representatives, uh, where we had a chance to uh, think of ways to develop technology that enables members of Congress to, to, uh, uh, to communicate with their constituents in a more kind of robust and constructive way. Uh, and um, that was a new project for me because I, I switched from sort of thinking about the role of interest groups and in policy making uh, to thinking about ways that individual citizens or you know residents in congressional districts um, could have a voice as well alongside interest groups in, in policy making, um, and so that that would that's been the project that I've worked on mostly since uh, for for the past decade or so. Well, let's go to the uh, you know your first work, which is really around this economy of expertise. Um, you know, can you talk about what questions did you have there and what answers, if any, did you find? So back in the 1990s, when I was writing my dissertation, the scholarly literature on Congress was very dismissive of the idea that uh, congressional committees or members of Congress cared about uh, research and expertise as they were writing policy. And I was really attracted to that both because if that was true, we, we would have a real problem because we want policy to be evidence-based. But it also was really inconsistent with what I, I saw, what I could observe when committees hold hearings and um, you know, when interest groups talk to committees and even when they talk to each other, most of the debate and a lot of the, the uh, kind of information that's communicated in hearings and in those discussions is really based on uh, and large part driven by by research, and so it it seemed kind of inconsistent with me the way political scientists thought about Congress and the way Congress actually uh, worked on the ground. And um, I think part of that is that it's it's easy to make generalizations about Congress based on uh, kind of the big blockbuster um, 
uh, you know, kind of controversial issues that, that you see in the newspaper. And I think when you see Congress trying to deal with bigger questions, it doesn't look so good. But if you look at what Congress does in a day-to-day -day way, they actually make use of research in a, in a pretty uh, sophisticated way, especially in the, in the committees. Um, and so what I was interested in is, is kind of solving that puzzle. You know, so what is it about, how, how is it that Congress, um, if members of Congress uh, you know, really are motivated by being reelected by their constituents who really don't know much about research, why are they making extensive use of research? And so that led me to really think about the role of interest groups and organized interest groups are, uh, they're, they're typically uh, well-funded and, but they also are, because they're organized um, and they have kind of a continuous presence, particularly those in Washington, DC, that they really know the research that matters to the policy areas that, that matter to them. Um, and, uh, and interest groups really, um, you know, that they typically want, they care about whether policies that impact them kind of, they care about how they function, right? And, and a lot of interest groups want policies to function in a way that make them better off. But what that means is that you really need to know how policies are going to work in order to make that assessment about what's the impact. And it turns out interest groups really have that information. Um, and, the, and, and so what I was interested in my dissertation is if interest groups are trying to talk to Congress about policies they care about and they're using policy research in order to do their lobbying, is, is it possible for con members of Congress to learn about the policy expertise on a topic um, based on the, the kinds of messages that they get from interest groups? And um, on the one hand, you would think that they really uh, would, would not learn that much because interest groups kind of, they're, they're self-interested, right? So they might kind of fabricate research or they might distort the research in a way that kind of misleads Congress. Uh, and I think, in that, and that's kind of what, what people worry about. Uh, but at the same time, interest groups care about their credibility. And there, it turns out that, that uh, there are some circumstances I was able to identify in my dissertation where uh, even though interest groups have their self-interest as they're lobbying, they're kind of induced to be truthful about what the research says. So it's not out of their self-interest, but just because of the, the circumstances they find themselves in. Um, and so because of that, I was able to identify certain uh, circumstances or certain types of hearings where the things that interest groups said were fully informative of what the research said and Congress could learn from that. And then there were other circumstances where they wouldn't, but that, that was mostly what I was interested in is sort of figuring out what those circumstances were, where, Congress actually could learn about policy expertise from interest groups. And what were those circumstances? So the, the most important thing is when the research itself has um, clear findings. And so there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of topics where scientists themselves have a lot of uncertainty about what the truth is, um, or if um, you know if Congress were to enact a, a policy a lot of times there's just a lot of uncertainty even in the scientific community um, about what would happen if Congress did that. And so in those circumstances, it's, it's sort of easier for groups to say different things. But if there's kind of a large consensus on um, and in a good evidence base for policymaking and that evidence base is well known in the research community, then that tends to constri constrain uh, interest groups because uh, if an interest group were to go to a committee and kind of misrepresent the research, it's very easy for other groups on the other side to point out the inconsistencies in that group's testimony and, and really undermine what they say. And so because of that, when there's a clear evidence, a clear kind of evidentiary basis for policy, the groups that, um, kind of want the policy to be enacted or are empowered to make use of research because it kind of supports their side. And the group that, that is opposed to the policy really isn't able to use uh, research because it's in, you know, that there just isn't a way for them to credibly use it. So that's kind of the biggest thing is kind of the consensus in the, in the policy community. 
And the, the example, the big example I used in my dissertation was the 1989 uh, Clean, Air, Clean Air Act amendments. There was a section there on emissions trading, which was, um, yeah, a big initiative of the Bush administration. And it turned out that there had been decades of research, uh, mostly among economists, but there was a really extensive evidentiary basis of what would happen uh, if, if Congress were to create this emissions trading program, pretty much everybody knew exactly what would happen. And, and so that was kind of the case that where you, you found that groups that were in favor of emissions trading kind of ex extensively talked about the research and the groups that were opposed to it really avoided talking about the research. So if we could break down this concept of expertise, right? Because what you talked about just there is quite a few different things in my mind. It's, it's facts, right, about the past, it's uh, assumptions about the future. And as you called it, I think it's a causal chain, right? Um, of, you know, if you do this, then this will happen. Uh, if you do that, something else will happen. You know, there's a credible causal chain that may or may not be established. So when you thought about the definition of this word expertise, what does it really mean if you break it down? And what kind, what are the components of this expertise that are being generated? So uh, fundamentally, when science scientists from any field um, do their science, they're working. Uh, they they they're interested in testing hypotheses, and the way we test hypotheses is using uh, kind of what what we call a falsificationist approach. Or, in other words, uh, if I'm going to test a, a hypothesis using data, I want to state that hypothesis in a way that the data can disprove it. Um, and so what we're what we do in science is we track transact and falsifiable claims. Um, and then those, those claims are hypotheses. So they're not, they're not true or false, but they're kind of theoretical statements about how we expect the world to work. And then in science, what we do is we gather data in order to kind of, to, to sort of show if the, if the hypothesis is compelling. And of course, the way we do that is we test the hypothesis to see if we can show it to be false. And if we can't show it to be false, then we, we accept it to be true. It's just the scientific method. It's a very basic statement of it. Well, I'm and a big so fan what, of Karl Popper. So I'm, I'm familiar yeah. with this falsification, but I also know that you've yeah. dabbled in the Bayesian side where, you know, that's yeah, part of the yeah. reason I'm asking, right? I mean, I'm yeah. trying to understand what expertise means because I, I can see where interest groups can bring facts. That, that, that are already out there, right? And then they're bringing this theory, a causal chain theory, which may have more or less legitimacy based on those facts. Yeah, so, uh, so, you, so Bayesian, so, so you mentioned Bayesian thinking. So in science, there's um, sort of two ways uh, that you could use data to test hypotheses. So there's the frequentist approach, which is the one I was just describing where you have a hypothesis and you collect lots of data enough to be able to, to say whether you can re reject the hypothesis or not. And then a Bayesian framework uh, is different where you kind of use data, you have kind of prior beliefs about whether the extent to which your hypothesis is true. And those beliefs could either be very certain or very uncertain, but you, we have ways to kind of characterize our beliefs about whether, about the, the truth of a hypothesis and then a Bayesian approach would collect data and then update those beliefs based on the data we observe and, and a, a, a method called, uh, called Bayes' rule, which is based in, the, in just essentially it's conditional probability. It's a way of kind of rationally updating our beliefs, our subjective beliefs about the truth of something based on data. So those are two um, kind of different frameworks within which scientists do kind of think about how to use data. And, and so as I was developing my, my earlier work, I was working within that kind of falsificationist uh, system or framework, right? To think about uh, the, 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 that, the, that falsifiability is kind of the core definition of what ex expertise is within that framework. And it's, it's not, um, uh, and, 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 the, and the reason that you, um, maybe that you mentioned sort of thinking in a Bayesian way is my more recent re research in the research itself, I use Bayesian methods in order to, to 
do, do my analysis. But the reason that I think it was really compelling to use this kind of um, sort of thinking about science, the role of the, the goal of science is to falsify hypotheses is that's rooted in uh, notions from this, uh, a very famous philosopher of deliberation, uh, uh, Jürgen Habermas. So if, I don't know if you've heard of him, but he's, uh, he's kind of maybe the most prominent, most famous uh, philosopher in the, the field of deliberative democracy, which is kind of defines sort of my, um, the kind of um, sort of philis my philosophical orientation towards politics. And, and Habermas was really interested in this notion of falsifiable, falsifiability. Um, in other words, if you and I could agree on a hypothesis that is worth testing, then it doesn't, the, either one of us could bring data to that and test it. And, and whatever the result is would be compelling to both of us because we've agreed on that, that that hypothesis was falsifiable. So, I, so I don't know if that makes sense, but that's, that's why I kind of rooted and oriented that earlier research in that, that sort of thinking about science in a falsifiable way. So if we take this discussion sort of back to the, the committee level in a hearing where you know, they're getting expertise from the special interests or even from their own staff, right? The mm -hmm. components of that expertise, would you say, are, are what? So w whenever uh, Congress, you know, or any government enacts a new policy, it's essentially a hypothesis about what the, re the, the effect of that policy can be. And so we know in political science that there can be unintended consequences of a policy. And so it could be that, that um, emissions trading was a, a beautiful idea. It was very, it's a very compelling, right? Just on paper, as the policy is written out, it seems to be a really good idea, um, but then, uh, sometimes even the best ideas when you actually implement them in practice can turn out to be terrible and be and make sort of everybody who thought it was going to be good it might make them worse off than they expected um right and so so you could think of whether the policy is going to do what it intends to do or not is a hypothesis and then if there's a lot of evidence right in, in sort of the yeah sort of, sort of thinking about the effects right the relationship between the policy and the outcomes of that policy is just a, it's a conjecture, right? And if you, um, if there's, uh, if there's um, evidence, you know, to suggest the hypothesis is, is true, right, in advance before Congress enacts it, right, then that lets them, gives them a really good idea about what's going to happen. But if there's no evidence, if it's a brand new idea and it's never been tested, then, um, Right then, it's then even Congress itself doesn't really know what would happen if they enacted. So, so that's that's kind of the big distinction there. When there's kind of a lot of evidence, then everybody knows what's going to happen, and then that kind of sorts out how people talk about the policy. Yeah. And, I, and one of the key premises are, of your book is that the politicians want a good outcome. So, I, in my book, I I limited the uh, policies that I looked at uh, to a set of a, a type of policy called socially efficient policy, which is policy that um, creates more winners than losers or has kind of more net benefits. And so a lot of policies uh, are, are kind of zero sum policies where some people win, some people lose. And in fact, economists worry about uh, policies like that sometimes create deadweight losses where the, where the um, policy not only creates winners and losers, but even everybody, it kind of loses a little bit because of inefficiencies from um, government interventions, right? And, and government interventions um, making markets deviate from like an efficient ideal. But there's uh, long been uh, this notion in uh, policy making that there are some kinds of policies that the government can do that can make lots of people better off all at the same time. And um, uh, even Adam Smith himself, uh, the famous Scottish Enlightenment philosopher, talked about uh, some of these policies that, um, yeah. And so, so what I what I focused on were the kind those kinds of policies where, if they were successful, then a lot of different interest groups would all be happy. They'd all be made better off. And there might be a few that would be made worse off, right? But 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 I only focused on those policies where 
sort of everybody, almost everybody wanted them to um, be in place if they were going to work. And so that that's that was how I was able to yeah, get around that to say that if um, if there was evidence that a, a, a good policy would be successful, right, then Congress would want to, to then, then Congress would be interested in it, but only if that evidence was in place, right? And if, if the evidence was lacking, then Congress would be, would be really uncertain about what the effects were, and, it, and so they would be less, less inclined to enact it. Did you find any other interesting kind of variables there, like, for instance, whether the policy took a long time to execute versus a short time, since there's more uncertainty the longer the, the longer the implementation phase or, or, you know, any, or if they were very, where, you know, senators or congressmen had different values at work in the program, you know, outside of its numbers? So, uh, so the other programs I looked at was a school choice policy that, um, Throughout the period that I examined, uh, 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 there was there there really was not compelling evidence throughout the period. So that that was an example of an area where Congress really remained uncertain. And then I, I looked at um, sort of an older case of healthcare reform, where the the sort of how you how how uh, you talked about the relationship between the policy and the outcome. Um, itself was different between different groups. And so you could think of, um, you know, like you could have, uh, uh, so sometimes there could be two different competing hypotheses, right? That if, if um, that the data might not rule out e uh, either, either one or, or the other of them, that that's, that can happen in science. And so in uh, healthcare, I, I, I saw that, that there need, that was a, an important circumstance where, um, uh, the 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 hypothesis itself had to be sort of agreed on in order for the data to matter. Yeah. And what about like highly minority views, right? Because obviously there might be a you know a certain number of scientists may think this causal chain it works, but there's gonna always gonna be someone right out there uh, who thinks differently. And What's the what's the magnitude of that voice in Congress? You know, they invite them in for a hearing or not, right? You know, or is it disproportionate to this number of scientists? Now, how do yeah. they balance that in a way that makes sense? So, so that I I didn't look at because I took the scientific community uh, for the most part. Um, uh, scientists kind of do a pretty good job at agreeing on sort of how to think about uh, policies and what the evidence is. Um, but, but there can be disagreements within the policy community, but, but, but those sometimes can get resolved in a way that makes it clear about kind of what the authoritative voice is. And so an example is, um, it, this isn't something that I studied, but people always would say to me, you know, when I was writing my dissertation, people would say, well, what about the tobacco companies and the, you know, that the tobacco um, institute, which is no longer with us, but they, they funded research to prove that tobacco didn't cause cancer, right? And so people would say, well, we'll, we'll look at the tobacco companies are actually producing research, right? They're funding research that is intentionally counter to, you know, the rest of the scientific consensus. And doesn't that undermine your argument? And what I would tell people is uh, think about how much more effective the tobacco companies would be and how much less money the Tobacco Institute would have to pay to do research if it was the case that smoking didn't cause cancer, right? So if smoking didn't cause cancer, then the Tobacco Institute wouldn't have had to kind of invest all of that money in um, this kind of counter programming that they were trying to do. And even then the, the research that that was produced through that effort didn't have the same sort of level of credibility. Um, so science, you know, science has mechanisms of peer review, and um, it, we we hear about uh, kind of failures of peer review. Sometimes they, there's kind of blockbuster things that we read about in the newspaper. But for the most part, scientists are pretty good at reading each other's work and um, uh, sort of. Um, yeah, at, at, at kind of criticizing each other's work and vetting each other's work. And so the peer review really kind of weeds out a lot of the bad research. Yeah. And then whatever is left over, 
right? Even if there's like a majority minority view, if that minority view passes peer review, then that would really meet the condition of kind of a dissensus within the research community. If, if um, yeah, and re research that's badly done, you know, if, if it's a minority view because it's, it's just bad research, then that tends to get weeded out through peer review. Excellent. Well, why don't we move on to another subject I know that you're engaged in, which is this kind of technology um, and, and its use in Congress and in potential engagement with constituents. Can you talk about what you're doing there? And you know, again, what questions have you been trying to answer and, and what have you found? So yeah, so in my that earlier work, I was really interested in the role of, of interest groups in policymaking and how interest groups are informative to committees. And then when I had got this NSF grant, uh, back in the kind of mid 2000s, I had a chance to think about the role of individuals and how individuals can have a voice in policy making as well. And um, that this work was collaborative with um, uh, uh, my, my colleagues, Michael Neblo, who's at Ohio State, and David Lazar, who's at Northeastern. And we were really interested in finding ways, uh, and it was collaborative too with the Congressional Management Foundation. Uh, and, and actually with the, uh, the grant was also a collaboration with uh, the Committee on House Administration in the House. And so it was kind of a big group of us were interested in sort of thinking about if we could uh, think of ways to design technology and think of best practices for the use of technology that enabled uh, individuals to be able to kind of learn about policies and then uh, after learning about policies, um, to have a constructive discussion with their member of Congress, so that they could, their their voice also could be could be heard in, in policy making, voices of of interest groups. Um, and so uh, this again, this research is all motivated by the this idea of deliberative democracy, which is an idea where um, if people have uh, a chance to have a debate with each other or a debate with their member of Congress. Uh, then a lot of times they'll be motivated to learn something about the policy topic that's going to be under debate and then to actually be able you know and then to be uh, have an opportunity to actually express to sort of learn about a policy topic and express that directly to representatives um, and so to sort of think about well how do we design technology that enables uh, individual constituents to do that so one thing uh, i'm always thinking about as it relates to this kind of question and also as it relates to expertise is this idea of um, representation and you know the number of voices that a representative can hear right if if certain voices of a of a of a district are magnified compared to others is that is that good or bad right uh, so you know I'm always concerned about the statistical representation of people that the rep is talking to. So if he shakes, you know, 2000 hands a year and talks to them, well, those people have a greater voice in his ear than, you know, the, you know, the 700,000 who didn't. And, you know, how do you deal with this kind of question or, you know, in your discussion or in your technology? So uh, there, uh, there's kind of two, two levels of my answer to that. So one level is um, just enabling members of Congress to hear their, their constituents at all is something that is, uh, it, it, uh, improves on representation, uh, a, a system of mass democracy where, where members of Congress really just hear from party leaders and interest groups, right? To make sure that individuals have a voice in policymaking is really important for, for representative democracy. Um, but then there's good and bad ways to do that. And, and I'll, you know, we all know that, um, so what the research that we did was we focused on designing technology uh, to enable online town halls. And we call them deliberative online town halls because they were opportunities for the member to kind of hear the voice of the community. And as, as, uh, as, as I'm sure you know, if you ever go to a town hall, uh, any kind of town hall by a public agency or elected official. Uh, well, here in, in Riverside, right? I know that if I go downtown to the city council or to some meeting that's downtown, I'm probably going to know half the people there because it's sort of the same people that, you know, people who are activists are the ones who show up um, 
right? Whatever the topic is. So if it's like a, a meeting on housing, it's kind of the homeowners all show up, right? To say that they don't want any more housing or wh wh whatever the activist is. And um, uh, that, that the activists are very, are, are not, so activism is, is super important for democracy. It's, it's essential for a well-functioning democracy for activists to, to, to have their voice heard, but, but to be for uh, representatives need to hear more than that. And they really need to hear from a cross section of their community. So one of the core things, um, kind of core principles of our online town halls that we, that is really central to what we did was to make sure that the people who showed up was a true cross section repre representation of the community. So for the research we used, we did a method that's a lot like the way survey researchers draw random samples from the community. Um, and there's different ways to do it, but, but to the extent that you can construct a town hall that has just kind of normal people, a cross section of the community, then that's really important for representatives to hear because that way they're really hearing from the community. And it's hard, there really aren't opportunities for them to, to hear that because if when they, themselves hold meetings, it's it's really always the same people who show up at the meetings, yeah. Right, so great. So you tried to get uh, a more average voter in than would be normally the case, which in itself could be a, a big success. Um, so what kind of information was created from these interactions and was, did it differ in any way from you know the other kinds of things they're doing, town halls or whatever? So, um, our goal uh, was to, to create a town hall where uh, the constituents would uh, learn, would, would be centered on a specific policy topic um, and that we would distribute reading material on that topic in advance. That was, that was balanced reading material. That wasn't, you know, that had sort of pro and cons and just factual information, but wasn't, um, was just balanced uh, and then, um, to give constituents an opportunity to actually learn about the nuances of that topic and then to come and to engage in a town hall where they could, could hear the hear what other residents were saying but also to have kind of a constructive exchange with their representative um and uh so and so that's what we found was we uh we uh we designed we worked with members of congress to design uh the, the online town hall town halls that would be focused on a topic that, that distribute reading material in advance. And that was hosted um, in a way that kind of created an environment where people, uh, where we welcomed people to engage constructively and speak across differences. And uh, we, we did a, an evaluation of our project and found that the people who, who went to our town halls became very uh, well informed of the policy topic so the topic that we looked at back then was U.S. immigration policy, um, and they became very informed on uh, the policy topic, and then they engaged with their member in a very constructive way, and the member engaged with them in a very constructive way. And we even saw uh, both liberal and conservative members of Congress kind of counter arguing and um, uh, even disagreeing with constituents who are liberal and conservative. So we had conservative members not just disagreeing with liberal constituents, but also disagreeing with um, conservative constituents to engage in this real genuine discussion. And the same with, with liberal uh, members of Congress. Um, so we were able to really induce that kind of more of a constructive environment. And the idea is then that way, when members of Congress engage and with their constituents who, uh, who are, have, um, who are informed and, and engaged constructively, then they are able to gain different kinds of insights from the community than they can uh, through a town hall where only activists show up or, or that they get from just the constituent mail that they get. It's just a different kind. And I think a deeper and more, um, yeah, a deeper kind of insight about how the community thinks about issues. So the sounds like the constituents got something out of it. They learned something about a topic then there was some dialogue or that included some agreement and disagreement all across the board. Mm -hmm. And so what exactly did the, the member get? Did they change their minds about anything? Did they, did they, how did it change them at all? Yeah. So, so that study 
uh, was designed to find the impact of the town halls on constituents. Okay. Uh, and we talked to the members afterwards and they all said how much they if appreciated and enjoyed it, but it wasn't designed to kind of test the impact. Like if they went back and kind of changed what they did or how they thought about, um, about le legislation. But we, um, we do, you know, our goal is to um, sort of change. So, we, so what, what we do want it to do is to find ways uh, for members of Congress to find input from their constituents to be uh, valuable and insightful to them. And um, uh, as you know, in congressional offices, you have the staff is usually divided into two in almost every single office, Republican or Democrat, where you have uh, the staff sitting at the front desk that are kind of getting, you know, opening the constituent mail and cranking out responses to them. And that's the, the constituent correspondence staff. And then on the other side of the office, you have the legislative staff, right, that are, that are kind of talking to interest groups and trying to think about, um, you know, like you know, how to write legislation that the member cares about. But it turns out in, in virtually all congressional offices, those staff don't talk to each other. So, so all of the stuff that's coming in from constituents doesn't really make its way over to legislative office of the legislative staff side. And um, it's not, it, it's, it, it makes a lot of sense because most of the uh, input that, that when people write to members of Congress, it tends not to be this kind of well thought out, well informed or deliberative, um, uh, communication that that they saw through our town halls it's usually kind of top of the head sort of angry letters uh, or or letters that have been organized by an in interest groups grassroots campaign uh, and so the letters that they get from constituents usually aren't that informative anyway right and so our idea is to kind of disrupt that to create a, a setting where constituents are telling members something that that they've thought about and they've um, they that and reflected on and they've learned about right and then they're engaging with the member in a constructive way and so what we want to do is to try to break down that dichotomy right where, where, where members of congress can think about input from individual constituents as something that's really relevant to the legislative work that they do so that's what we're trying to do with that um, with that project um, but it's just it's something that we haven't really tested that so far and that's great. And I mean, it sounds like the key element there is the structuring of the engagement, right? And then also this preparation ahead of time, um, you know, some so coming in with some knowledge uh, as opposed to in order to make the dialogue, you know, more productive. So that's very interesting.